Hey there gang, I've got an oldie here today. I was just checking out the serial numbers online to figure out what year it's from. It seems to be a 1921 or 22. This is a Gibson A model mandolin. This is an A junior. Now the juniors were the introductory line for Gibson at that time period. Um, just like a regular A except it's got no binding, no side dot markers, there's no Gibson logo on the headstock. The uh, Top wood is perhaps a step down from their top of the line instruments. Still pretty good though. The back seems to be made out of, that looks like birch to me. The neck is mahogany. It's been stained brown. And the top, as I said, that's it's slightly wider grain than you'd see in some of them. Um, and it might not be perfectly cut on the quarter, but seems to be hanging together pretty well. Not too long ago, the owner put on some replacement tuners. I think these are the Golden Age ones from Stuart McDonald, which is nice. Those are good quality. The reason this is here today is the owner would like me to do a fret job on this. We're going to replace these frets, which are the originals. They're very narrow, and at this point, quite low. Checking out there, it's uh, 17 or 18 thousandths in a lot of places, which is less than half a millimeter. It's a real fretless wonder. Uh, it still plays, but it doesn't feel all that great. He thinks it'd be better with higher and wider frets with more of a crown on them, and I tend to agree. The other thing we're going to do is put a radius on this board. These were all shipped with flat fingerboards, uh, just a manufacturing expediency. It's easier to make them flat, and it's also quicker to fret them. Um, but it's true that when you've got a bit of a radius, it's easier to chord, easier to play, and uh, most modern makers are putting a radius on their fingerboards these days. I'm going to give them a 16-inch radius. So to do that, I'm going to have to remove the um, pearl dots here and replace them so that we don't sand through them while we're doing that operation. And with a taller wire, we're going to need a new nut. So I'll put a new ebony nut on there for him. And this is an aftermarket bridge with the uh, wedge adjustment in it. So I'll make him a new insert that will accommodate the radius, uh, the same radius as the fingerboard. Sound good? Now I know there's going to be some armchair enthusiasts in the comments clucking their tongue at me because I'm modifying this valuable vintage piece. Uh, don't I know that this is the golden age of Gibson mandolin making? Um, I checked out, guys. There's there's no Lloyd Lore signature in this, all right? He only signed one A-style mandolin, and it certainly wasn't an A junior. They made an awful lot of these. They're not that rare. They're pretty common, and uh, this is a a working musician's instrument. I feel no qualms about making this board into a radius for him. If need be, I could always put another flat one on for the next guy who wants to be a purist. Now before I take the strings off, there are a number of measurements I want to record and some things that need to be done. Actually, just looking at it, there is a little bit of green painter's tape under one corner of this bridge here, which I'm assuming is a positioning device. It intonates very well right now where it's positioned, so I was about to do that anyway. Um, I've got my own green painter's tape. Uh, you have to be careful with this stuff, obviously on a very old, fragile finish like this. Uh, so I'm not sticking it down hard, and I've actually reduced the tack by touching it to my shirt, picking up a little bit of fuzz. And we'll just mark the position. Now this isn't set in stone. I'm probably going to want to move that bridge a little bit, but it's good to have a reference point to get it back in the right spot, sort of. Next thing I'm going to do is check the action. At the 12th fret here, we have about 3 64ths on the bass and about 3 64ths on the treble, which is reasonable. And the player said that he thought it was not bad. And um, we can shoot for that again. So 3 64ths, that's about 1.2 millimeters, which is it's kind of an average mandolin action. There are people who like it lower and people who like it higher. The next thing I'm going to do is check out the relief on this instrument with the string tension on. Rather than using the frets as a, a reference point, I'm, I've got a precision steel rule here. It's actually part of a, a square. Um, resting that right on the frets. And I'm going to use the sixth fret as a reference point. It's what I normally do. And I've already checked this. This is actually about eight thousandths of an inch, which is like 0.2 millimeters. 
with the string tension on. When I take the strings off, I'll, I'll put this back here and measure it again and see what it is. And that will tell us how much the neck moves under string tension. Now this is going to seem like complete heresy, but I'm actually saving these old mandolin strings. Um, whenever you're doing a setup, like if I'm cutting a new nut for this thing, I'm not sure if I have to. I don't know yet. I might be able to get away with this one and maybe shim it with some ebony on the bottom. But if I have to do a new one, that's a lot of tuning and detuning. And you go through two sets of strings when you're doing a setup anyway. Um, to get the gross measurements and, and do stuff like that with a the nut, there's a lot of stress that goes on, so might as well do them on some old strings and then save the good ones for your final setup. With the strings removed and all the tension off the neck, I can go back and revisit that relief measurement, and I see that we're now at about four thousandths of an inch, or 0.1 millimeters, which is good to know. So this is only shifted about four thousandths of an inch. Should give you some indication just how stiff this neck is. If it was a really floppy neck and it had exhibited a whole bunch of back bow, I would need to know that because there's no truss rod in this, and uh, I'd have to plane that figure into it while I was making the, the fingerboard surface so that it would come forward into the proper relief with string tension. In this case, I know I'm just going to be able to plane the board flat and also flatten the tops of the frets in one single plane. Don't have to worry about the relief because it's going to come forward into about the right amount for us. So that's good. Um, problem necks were the reason why, you know, Dan Earlywine designed the neck jig that would hold this in the correct location. But with a short board like this and a good stiff neck, we're not going to need that in this particular instance. We can talk about fret wire selection. Actually, I'm just noticing there is a chunk out of the treble side of the fingerboard here, which you can both feel and see, and I don't like it. I can't let that go. I'm going to have to fill that with something before we actually put the wire in. Anyway, um, the size of these is probably around 40 thousandths, around one millimeter. Yeah. And at its tallest, up in an unworn section, the board's around, probably around 35 thousandths. Yeah, it's around 32 there. Modern wire is just a little bit wider. It's around 50 thousandths. You can hardly notice the difference. And functionally, it's pretty much exactly the same. Like, you, you could use this and it would not stick out like a sore thumb. A lot of people, and I'm saying like 8 out of the 10 mandolins I've refretted in my life, have wanted something a little bit bigger than that though. This is a small guitar wire. It's around 79 thousandths wide, just under 2 millimeters. About the same height. And for some reason, the wider wire feels easier to move on. Um, this stuff here, even though it's very, very low, your finger bumps into it all the way along. It's kind of sharp feeling. It bounces. This stuff, I guess the uh, semicircular nature of it, you get a bit wider crown, you're, it feels more buttery. You move past it with some more ease and people really like it. I talked to the uh, customer about that and he was he was ready for this stuff. He wants this. And you know it doesn't look wrong and in terms of intonation you don't have to worry because you're still contacting the very top of a semicircle, like right in the center. So. It's not going to change the intonation points. It's just fine. To start off with, I'm cleaning the board with some naphtha, getting up around the sides of the frets as much as possible. These can be a bit of a trick to get out. I'm going to take the nut off so I'm just scoring around it with a scalpel very lightly, just to make sure there's nothing holding it in place. When I go to knock it out. Came off very nice and clean. I'm going to save that. I might be able to reuse it. These frets are so low that it can be difficult to get the nippers under them. So I'm going to clean out any sludge that's built up right in the corner between the fret and the fingerboard. What this also does is it makes a very light scoring line right on the edge of the fret. And that can help prevent tear out as I pull the frets upwards. You know, there are little barbed tangs on either side of the fret. And they can do damage to the board. 
by putting this little tiny score line here. Now it's not deep, it's just on the surface. What it does is it kind of prevents any tearing of the fibers from moving past the edge of the fret. Um, it just makes it a cleaner process. I'm using a soldering iron to heat up the fret and uh, allow for easy removal. You can see that some glue bubbled up at the end there as it got hot enough to melt. That's usually a good sign. These are my flush ground fret removal pliers. They help me get up under it and I walk it along slowly, loosening it as I go. Don't want to rip this thing out otherwise it could tear the wood. Because I'll be sanding a radius onto this fretboard, I need to remove these at least these outer two fret dot markers here on the 12th fret because they're close enough to the edge that I could possibly sand through them when I'm doing the radius. So I'm just using this little tiny silicone heater blanket there to warm them up and make the glue pliable. These fit very tightly in the holes and I had to pop them out with the edge of a chisel. Before trying to repair this damage on the edge of the fingerboard, I really want to get it clean. So I'm using some naphtha, scrubbing out any dirt, oils, gunk, or whatever's in there. And then after that, I lightly sanded the surface as well. To plug the hole, I'm using a mixture of medium viscosity super glue and ebony sanding dust. I'll put one layer on there. While it's still wet, I come back with some more sanding dust and really pack that surface full. When that's cured, I scrape and sand it flush. Here I'm using my flat sanding beam, which I made out of a level to do a preliminary uh, flat surfacing on the fingerboard. You can see the high spots show up there. This is my radius sanding block, which I'll use to put the radius on. You can see I've got some yellow colored pencil on there. That just lets me know how far I'm progressing. I'm re-drilling for the inlay. I'm putting these in with a little bit of fish glue and working some sanding dust in around the edges there to make sure it's all full. Sanding that off with some 220 grit paper. I'm setting the depth stop on my fret saw here. I don't want a whole lot of empty slot underneath the fret tang, so this is about five thousandths of an inch or so deeper than that. And just re-establishing those fret slots to the correct depth. It's good practice to gently relieve the corners of the fret slots using this three-corner file or something similar. That'll make any future removal of frets much easier. I'm using my fret bender to put a radius on the fret wire. It's just slightly tighter than the radius of the board, so it's probably around 15 inches in total radius. I'm cleaning off any grease or oils on the wire that's left over from its manufacture. Now I can trim each fret to length, just a little wider than the board at each location, and I store them in this block. This is something a little bit unusual. Not everyone does this. I like to trim back the ends of the fret tang, even for unbound boards like this. It prevents it from sticking out past the end of the board if it ever dries out. Just cleaning up the very end here with a bit of a file. I'm filling the fret slot with some fish glue here. That will take up any space around the fret and really lock it into place so there's no chance for it to get loose. Here's the traditional way of seating frets. I'll knock in both corners and then work my way across. This will flatten out that over radius and push the uh, barbs of the tank slightly sideways in the wood. I also use this device here. This is a fret press. They both have their uses in different areas. When I get to the top end of the board, 
I have to be careful because it's unsupported in there. I use a little block to um, provide support underneath the fingerboard extension. It's time to cut off these exposed fret ends. The glue's had a day and a half to dry. Uh, here's a tip for those who are just beginning. It makes sense, you think, to present the clippers like this so that the, um, the jaws are parallel with the top surface of the fretboard. What can happen is you can apply a little bit of pressure as you clamp down that will pull the ends of the frets up a little bit, making them loose. It's far safer to do it like this. Just get a good clean cut because the fret isn't going to shift backwards and forwards laterally in its slot, so it's safe. It's, it's good and firm. Um, you can see I've got a piece of white paper under here. Definitely have to clean up after this operation because one of these little guys underneath the finished guitar will cause all kinds of problems. They're very sharp. I'm using a file to flush up and bevel the ends of the frets. I don't like a very wide bevel, especially on these smaller instruments. I want to preserve as much playing width as possible on the frets. So it's only about a 15 degree bevel. Any places that are left unfilled by the glue on the ends of the frets are filled up with some super glue and some sanding dust. I'm darkening the fret tops with some marker. And here I am leveling them. They were very level to begin with. There wasn't very much to come off. Just a couple of strokes. And because of that, it didn't take very long to recrown them either. People ask if it's okay to use a Dremel tool with buffing compound to bring up a mirror shine, and that's fine. You'll find that it goes away pretty quickly. You'll play through it. Here I'm just getting the ends of the frets with a file, and I'll polish those as well. Using a little polymerized tongue oil here on the board to bring up a shine and seal it off just a little bit. There was nothing wrong with the original nut, it was just a bit too low now, so I'm grafting on a piece of ebony. Time to make a new insert for the bridge. I'm uh, sanding a 16 inch radius on top of the saddle using a sanding block. Rounding over its corners. I transferred over the string lines and other dimensions from the previous bridge and here I am filing it to shape, working on the intonation pattern. Ebony is really the dirtiest wood. It gets all over everything. The bottom surface on this saddle has a couple of inclined planes on it and these match up with some wedges that are fitted inside the bridge. These are loose and there are two adjustment screws, one on either side to push these in and out. That's how you affect the uh, saddle height adjustment on this model of bridge. getting the string height dialed in here at the nut. This is why I saved those old strings because I have to tune and retune these several times during the process. There we have it, all set up and ready to play. I was pretty happy with the way this turned out. As usual, I'll try to give you some sounds on this thing. I am definitely not a mandolin player, so don't be too critical. <laughs>